So I'm going to call this meeting of the Zoning Board of Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals to order. Today is Tuesday, January 5th, 2021. Um, good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm that members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members from the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Aaron Ford. Here. Stephen Revelak. Here. Nishana Rourke. Here. Excellent. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> from the town, our administrator, Rick Ballarelli. Here. Perfect. Um, and Vincent Lee. Here. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Doug Heim, town council. Here. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm anticipating. Um, I know Emily Sullivan is here um, from the planning department. Do you know if um, uh, Ms. Rate's coming this evening? I think she might be coming. Last I checked, yes. Okay. Keep an eye out for her. Um, <clears throat> and then um, Council Paul Haverty. Here. Perfect, thank you. And um, on behalf of the applicant, um, Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor is the. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. And then I'll have Mary, I'll ask you to introduce your team uh, when we get there. Certainly. Perfect. So, um, this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020. The order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet re remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during the public hearing. <clears throat> For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it is being broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Other participants are participating by computer audio or phone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care not to share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. And so that brings up the first item on our agenda this, this evening, which is the approval of the meeting minutes uh, from December 22nd, 2020. Um, there were minor corrections made by uh, Stephen Revelak. Are there other corrections to the minutes? No. Not seeing any from the board. Can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you, Roger. And a second? Second. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Quick vote down. Um, uh, Roger? Aye. Patrick? Aye. Kevin? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Stephen? Aye. And Sean? Aye. Perfect. So those minutes are approved. Okay. And then the so the next item, <clears throat> the, we're now turning to the comprehensive permit hearing for 1165R Massachusetts Avenue. I want to review some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. This evening, the board is opening a new comprehensive permit hearing. The proposed project, 1165R Mass Ave, is a redevelopment of an existing site in the industrial district. The submitted documents are available as an attachment to the posted agenda, and those documents will be posted to the board's website. 
We open this evening with an introduction to the comprehensive permit procedure by attorney Paul Haverty. Then town council Doug Heim will address any local implications of the comprehensive permit law. The applicants will then be invited to introduce themselves and their team. They will have a brief presentation on the proposed project and then the board will present questions to the applicant before opening the hearing for public comment and questions. Public comments and questions will only be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing the board's decision. Due to previously demonstrated interest in this project and to provide an orderly flow for the meeting, the chair strongly encourages individual public speakers to limit their comments and to use their time to provide comment related solely to the topics discussed at this hearing. Please note there will be multiple hearings scheduled for this project and each hearing will have an opportunity for public comment. The chair also encourages the public to provide written comments to be reviewed by the board and included in the record. The chair will first ask members of the public who have previously identified themselves by logging through Zoom who wish to speak to digitally raise their hand using the raise hand function in the participants tab of the Zoom application. Then we'll then call on those who are participating by phone to dial star nine to indicate they would like to speak. And once all questions and comments have been addressed or the allocated time has been expended, public comment period for this evening will be closed. And as noted previously, there are multiple hearings scheduled on this project and each hearing will have an opportunity for public comment. So with that, I would like to um, reintroduce uh, Paul Haverty, who is um, board's counsel or, I'm sorry, the board's counsel, but Paul, if you could explain your role um, to, the, to the general public. Certainly, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am here as uh, a consultant that's being provided through uh, Mass Massachusetts Housing Partnership. Um, they have a technical review fund in which allows municipalities to actually avail themselves of um, uh, an expert in Chapter 40B. In my experience, I'm a, an attorney that does a lot of Chapter 40B development, both representing boards and representing um, developers. Um, however, <clears throat> there are other consultants that Mass Housing Partnership uses, including um, planners, engineers, and things of that nature. So it really depends upon the type of guidance that a board is looking for um, in terms of what, uh, which person the board requests for their, their consultants. Um, Chapter 40B is a state law that allows an applicant to file a single comprehensive permit application with the Board of Appeals. And the Board of Appeals then acts as the sole local permit granting authority uh, under that application. So all other local um, requirements, all other local approval processes are subsumed into the 40B application process. Um, and the, the filing of a comprehensive permit application also allows the applicant to request waivers of local rules and requirements. Um, that does not apply to rules and requirements that are of a state nature that are being applied locally. So the Conservation Commission under the State Wetlands Protection Act, uh, Board of Health under local, I'm sorry, under Title V, um, the Building Commissioner under the Mass State Building Code all retain their jurisdiction under those processes and, and the, the Board of Appeals is not acting um, as those entities as part of this process, but all other local permits are being granted as part of the comprehensive permit process. Um, the town becomes subject to comprehensive permit applications if it doesn't meet certain statutory or regulatory minimum requirements. Um, the one that's obviously most well known is the 10% year round housing, um, which Arlington has not met. Um, there's also a, a statutory requirement that, that has to do with the 1.5% total land area. Um, and I know that this is an issue that Arlington has gone through on multiple occasions, and we can talk about that further if the board so chooses. Um, then there's also a statutory requirement having to do with 0.3% of the total land area zoned in the community for residential, commercial, or industrial use. I have never seen that applied. Um, I, I don't think... Uh, that there, there really has ever been a circumstance where that's been applied. Um, there are also regulatory safe harbor provisions. There's a housing production plan safe harbor 
that applies when a town has 0.5% or 1% of its um, total year round housing um, approved as affordable within a, a particular year's period. Um, but it only applies if the town has an approved housing production plan. Then there's also a recent progress provision and that takes a one year look back from the date of the application and sees if the town has approved 2% of its total year round housing units as affordable units. Um, there's also a large project safe harbor, um, which for Arlington is actually gonna be somewhere around 400 units. So clearly not implicated in this application. Um, and then there's also a related application safe harbor. So that is frequently known as the one year cooling off period. And it says that if there is an application for some sort of relief, whether it be a, a subdivision or a special permit, site plan approval um, for a project that didn't include a minimum of 10% affordable housing, then the applicant has to wait a year before they're allowed to go forward on a comprehensive permit application. So for an applicant filing a 40B, um, there are certain criteria that they have to meet. Um, their, for their submittal, they have to be able to show that their applicant status is either as a public agency, a nonprofit entity, or a limited dividend organization. For the most part, you're going to see applications that are made by limited dividend organizations or somewhat frequently nonprofits, usually not public agencies. Um, the applicant is also required to submit evidence of site control with its application and it has to include a project eligibility letter from a, a subsidizing agency. So there are four subsidizing agencies that issue these types of project eligibility letters is Mass Housing, Mass Housing Partnership, Mass Development, and the Department of Housing and Community Development. Other 40B application submittal requirements, um, the applicant has to submit preliminary plans um, they're not required to, to submit final design plans as part of this process. Um, the way it works is the final design plans are actually submitted after a permit has issued rather than before a permit is issued. Um, although the line can get somewhat blurred as you go through the process and the board asks for additional information, um, you usually see plans get pretty firm before a permit is issued, but technically preliminary plans is all that's needed to be submitted. The applicant is also required to submit um, existing site conditions and a locus map, preliminary scaled architectural drawings, tabulation of proposed buildings by type, size, and ground coverage, preliminary subdivision plan if a subdivision is being proposed, a preliminary utilities plan, and a list of requested waivers. As I had indicated previously, an applicant is allowed to request waivers of any local rule and regulation, um, and the board has to take those into consideration when making this decision. Um, there are a number of deadlines that need to be kept in mind throughout the, the public hearing process, um, some of which are more directory rather than compulsory. Um, within seven days, the town should distribute the application to various departments. Um, within 14 days of receiving a comprehensive permit application, there should be a, a notice of public hearing published. The public hearing is required to be opened within 30 days of the, the filing of the application. And then once the public hearing has been opened, within 15 days of that opening, the board needs to provide any notification of safe harbor that it may have or believe that it has to the applicant. That notification has to be in writing um, and that written communication has to include the basis for the claim of the safe harbor. Um, so when, for instance, uh, numerous times I've represented municipalities that have achieved a housing production plan safe harbor. So that's very straightforward. Um, once a, a municipality has achieved a housing production plan safe harbor, they get notification from the state and all you need to do is submit a copy of that notification with the letter notifying the applicant that the safe harbor applies. Now, the fact that the board is providing notification of a safe harbor being applicable does not mean that the, the board is denying the project. Um, I have been involved in numerous 
applications in which a safe harbor notification has been provided, but the board has still gone on to actually approve the project um, in a manner that did not require a, an appeal by the developer. Um, presuming that the board issues a safe harbor notification, the applicant then has 15 days to appeal that safe harbor to DHCD, um, at which point DHCD would then have 30 days to render a decision on the notification. <clears throat> there is also a interlocutory appeal provision after DHCD issues its answer, um, but at that point the hearing before the board would be stayed. Um, the rest of the deadlines wouldn't then apply until it's asserted. Um, once the, the board opens a public hearing, it has 180 days for which to conduct its business and then close the public hearing. Um, once the public hearing has been closed, the board has 40 days to render its decision. And then there's a 20 day appeal period that's associated with that decision. Um, the board can and should retain peer review consultants as part of its review process. Um, that can include civil engineering, traffic, architecture. Financial review can be done, but only under certain constrained circumstances um, in which the, all other review has been completed. The board has provided the applicant a draft decision that contains all of the conditions and all of the proposed waiver decisions. And then the applicant has informed the board that those conditions and waiver decisions render the project uneconomic. At that point in time, the board can then uh, engage in a review of the pro form. So in terms of the process in front of the board, the board should really focus on real project issues and impacts early in the review process. Peer review process should be commenced as soon as possible, because again, that 180 day period tends to run a lot more quickly than you would think. Um, so the sooner you get started on the peer review process, the more time you have left um, at the end to do a pro forma review if the board deems that necessary. So negotiation and work sessions um, are possible. Um, it can often be very productive to have a, a work session between um, town staff or between um, the town peer review engineers and the applicants peer review engineers. Um, no decisions can be made as part of that process and obviously you have to comply with the open meeting. So in terms of making a decision, the board has to balance regional housing needs with local concerns. So local concerns would consist of health, safety, environmental, design, open space, planning, or other local concerns. Um, in terms of the end of the process, once the board has closed the public hearing, um, then it can hold a deliberative session. Um, those deliberative sessions have to be held in public. Um, they're not an open hearing, so once the, the public hearing is closed, no more information can be taken in by the board. Um, but the board can deliberate in a logical and orderly fashion, discuss potential conditions, and review the requested waivers. Um, when drafting and issuing a comprehensive permit decision, the board has three decision alternatives. They can deny the project. Um, they can approve the project as submitted, and I will tell you I've never seen that occur or it can approve the project with conditions, which is the most common result. So when approving with conditions, the conditions should not render the project uneconomic. Um, the conditions and or requirements must be consistent with local needs. And this is an important one. The board may not reduce the number of units for reasons other than evidence of local concerns within the board's purview. And that's actually taken straight from the DHCD regulations. Uh, appeals of the board's decision, um, if, if by the applicant are taken to the Housing Appeals Committee, um, and I will say the Housing Appeals Committee is certainly a developer-friendly forum. It was intended to be that way. It's intended to help facilitate the creation of affordable housing in the Commonwealth. 
Uh, appeals for other aggrieved parties will go to either Superior Court or the Land Court. Um, and I think that is good for now. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. That's very, very complete. Uh, are there any quick questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Hanlon. Mr. Hammond, at, at the end, you uh, said that uh, the local concerns need to be, or the, the conditions need to be supported by local <clears throat> concerns, which need to have evidence in support of them. And I just wanted to explore that a little bit. Sometimes when you read the opinions, they're looking at a fairly specific evidentiary basis, something like a general concern with, with uh, a pedestrian friendly environment or something like that uh, would not be sufficient, that there needs to be something that is specific to this particular location and not a, a general policy rationale. Could you explain a little more just what kind of an evidentiary basis is necessary for each of the conditions that the board might ultimately, oppose, uh, ultimately impose? Sure, so the, the first thing the board has to keep in mind um, is that it, it can't simply rely upon the existence of local rules and regulations that address a particular issue. Um, there is a case um, that my partner, Mark Bobrowski, was involved in in Holliston several years ago that went up to the appeals court. And essentially, um, the, the Board of Appeals sought to rely upon local wetlands concerns. And they had a wetlands bylaw, and the bylaw addressed um, the specific concerns that were being raised by the board. And so they, you know, the board chose not to grant waivers of that local bylaw. And the Housing Appeals Committee determined that that wasn't sufficient, that they had to, they had to provide not only the general concerns, you know, throughout the town, but specific concerns as it related to this project and why those particular um, regulations that were in excess of the Wetlands Protection Act standards were necessary to protect those interests on this particular property. Um, and that's sort of you know, applicable throughout. Um, although health, safety, environmental design, open space, planning, or other local concerns theoretically can be sufficient to support either an approval with conditions that render the project uneconomic or a denial, um, those concerns have to outweigh the regional need for affordable housing. And that's the balancing act that the Housing Appeals Committee will undertake on appeal. And, and I will let you know that more often than not, the, the balancing goes against the municipality rather than in favor of it. So you really need to have something that stands out as an issue of local concern to support either a denial or particular conditions rendering a project on economic. Mr. Chairman, if I could ask one other question, please. The, as you know, Mr. Haverty, the town in, in another notable 40B case uh, that is currently pending has litigated uh, its asserted safe harbor, harbor under the 1.5% yep. um, uh, limitation. <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out a little better what the relationship might be between our asserting that safe harbor uh, provision in this case and whether that might either affect the other case that's currently pending or any other cases that may happen in the in the future are you sort of required to assert that on pain of losing your ability to assert it in other cases or is this something that that you could be inconsistent if you wanted to uh or in any event your decisions in one case is don't as a practical matter affect what happens in other cases so you have to assert it if you want to use it in this case you're not required just because a municipality has a safe harbor they're not required to assert it during a comprehensive hearing process and it doesn't have any impact upon any other comprehensive permit process i mean it may be that a municipality chooses not to assert a safe harbor because it actually is in favor of a particular application and just doesn't see the need to go through that process um, so it not asserting it here does not impact your claims with regards to any other pending or any other future 40B development. 
Um, but it does impact your ability to assert it in this project. If you don't provide the notice within the 15 days, then you are not allowed to assert that safe harbor at the end of the process to support whatever your decision says. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. <clears throat> Any other questions from the board? Seeing none, then I'd like to introduce um, Town Council Douglas Hine to, uh, to address some uh, local issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, members of the board, uh, residents of Arlington, uh, town staff, and uh, the applicants team. First of all, I wanna say that I'm, I'm grateful to have the uh, additional resource that uh, Attorney Haverty provides. As folks know, these are, are very uh, staff uh, intensive uh, permit applications. And there's a team of folks who work behind the scenes um, to make sure that we get all the information that the zoning board needs. Um, in addition to all the uh, tremendous amount of work and hours and evenings that the zoning board uh, puts in to uh, properly scrutinizing any 40B application. I just wanna speak really bluntly since I'm sure everybody's had enough of, uh, uh, doesn't need more uh, uh, from, from me uh, given the thoroughness of Mr. Haverty's uh, presentation. Just wanna speak with bluntly about a few things that are, are common things that come up in 40B applications in the very specific context of Arlington so that folks have expectations, uh, residents, uh, the applicants, uh, the board. Um, I'm not gonna take them in any particular order of importance. Uh, I'm just gonna address them sort of head on. So uh, one thing that I wanna sharpen very clearly for everybody, uh, Mr. Haverty talked about it in, in, in sort of uh, more general terms, but one of the things that we're not, that the zoning board can't consider in any 40B application is the impact on schools, right? This is something that comes up a lot People are concerned, okay, we're building a large development. What's the impact gonna be on school class size? And uh, there have been many, many, many cases that say that you can't, the zoning board can't consider that. I'm not saying it's not important, uh, but the zoning board's decision can't factor that in. Indeed, and I wouldn't impute this to anybody's intent, but I want just folks to understand where the courts are coming from on these issues, uh, they basically, express concern that that uh, is unintentionally discriminatory to basically say, uh, you know, we can't build affordable housing because it'll have uh, impact on our, our school enrollments. Uh, similarly, uh, I'm aware, as I'm sure the zoning board is, as I'm sure lots of folks in this call are, about um, the discussions about um, our industrial uses, um, our industrial zone and, um, you know, building or uh, redeveloping um, a lot of the industrial uses that, that aren't currently uh, being utilized. Uh, there's very little that the zoning board can do about that. The, the fact that a project is sited in an industrial zone is uh, not something that the board has a lot of discretion to say, well, because this is an industrial zone, we're going to veto this project or we're not going to approve this project. Um, it's not generally something that, um, for reasons I think Mr. Haverty explained in a lot of detail, uh, the board can just say, well, we don't want residential in an industrial zone. Mr. Haverty, if you have a more, a finer point on that, um, I'm amenable to it, but I just want to sort of speak very plainly to folks about that. Um, third, the uh, process is, um, is, is one where the board, uh, Mr. Haverty again spoke about this uh, in a very balanced fashion, but it is, extremely rare that a zoning board just says, no, we're not gonna have, a, we're, not, we're gonna say no, we're gonna veto or we're gonna reject the project. And the reasons for that are many. Uh, the reasons for it may be because, hey, most of these projects are, are well received by boards, but the practical matter is, is that if you just say, we're rejecting a project outright, the HAC is a very, very, very uh, difficult forum uh, for municipalities because the state and the state laws mandate the creation of affordable housing. Therefore, if a board just says, no, we don't wanna do it um, at all. We're not gonna approve a version of it. We just don't wanna prove it at all. The most likely outcome is that an applicant um, uh, has the project approved as they submitted it without any conditions. 
uh, without any tailoring towards Arlington's uh, specific circumstances or needs. And I say that not to reflect at all on this application or this applicant. I just say it so that there's a common understanding that um, the state has a very, very strong mandate that basically says we're overriding your local zoning controls because we are saying as a matter of state law, creating affordable housing is that important. So I, I don't mean to start anything off in a negative uh, sense. I just want folks to understand the landscape in which uh, the board is making a decision. I have a few additional comments on this safe harbor matter, but I believe Mr. Klein that there, Mr. Chairman, that there's some time set aside for that a little bit later on down the road. And so I don't wanna have, you know, too much further discourse about it now, unless any members of the board have a question for me at this point in time. Mr. Chairman, I do have a question specific to that. Please, Mr. DuPont. So either to uh, Mr. Heim or Mr. Haverty, um, I realize that we can't calculate the prior, the other 40B project that's being considered as no building permit has yet been issued. So you can't really calculate that into the, where the town stands with regard to either the 10% or the one and a half percent land area. And I'm not saying as a matter of a, to, to consider this next project, this is important, but has anybody made any sort of a calculation as to where this uh, Mass Ave project would bring us with respect to Safe Harbor if it were to be built? Mr. Chairman, may I? Please, Mr. Heim. So um, the, the, there has not been an official calculation made because again, we wouldn't do that until not only something was approved, but it would have to be built and then placed on um, uh, DHCD's basically inventory of affordable housing. Uh, Mr. Haverty, if I'm mistaken about that, please feel free to jump in, but it, it's not enough even for it to be permitted. It has to be built and placed on the housing inventory. I will say that the calculation, as folks may recall, if you've been following other 40B hearings, is close by most metrics. Um, so the approval of uh, a 40B uh, would significantly um, improve the town's ability to assert one and a half percent safe harbor status in other contexts, if that's you. what you're getting at, Mr. DuPont. Mr. Haverty, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. I don't want to speak for the chair. Uh, the only thing that I would add is, is the town does actually get to count the units in the 40B development as soon as they are approved. Oh, um, however, after a year, they fall off of your subsidizing housing inventory if a building permit hasn't been pulled, which generally you don't see a building permit pulled within a year after approval. Um, so you would temporarily get to count them, but more likely than not, they would fall off until they actually do begin construction. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Thank you both. Um, Mr. DuPont, did you have any further questions? No, that was it, thanks. Okay. Um, with that in mind, um, I would like to uh, reintroduce um, Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor, who is the attorney for the applicant. Um, and if she could uh, introduce herself and her team and give us a presentation on the proposed project. Thank you, Chairman Klein, uh, members of the board, attorneys Heim and Harrity and fellow residents of the town. Um, we are pleased to be able to present this project to the Zoning Board of Appeals for issuance of a comprehensive permit at this site. This has been a project has been a long time in the making. The development team has uh, been involved with many, if not all of the departments in the town of Arlington to get input for this project. They have been to the Board of Selectmen, as you know, in your package, uh, uh, you have a letter of support from the Board of Selectmen for this project, along with um, the uh, letter from Mass Housing. Um, the, the, they've been to the Department of Planning, Conservation Commission, Historic District Commission, and also the development team has met with uh, the Building Department, Engineering Department, Fire Department, and received uh, comments and their input. Um, also, the team has uh, made a presentation to the neighborhood and has made available 
the plans and the traffic impact study. Uh, the developers of this project, and this is a, a limited dividend organization, are, is the Myrak family and Bob Myrak is on the call. I'm sure many of you uh, members of the board and members of the public are familiar with uh, the Myrak family and their stewardship of their properties in the town of Arlington. A comparable property that the Myraks develop and self-manage is the legacy, which is in Arlington Center. Um, Spalding and Sly is uh, involved in this joint venture and Daniel St. Clair is the project executive and managing director. He is on this call. And Spalding and Sly has significant multifamily design and construction experience. And I would direct you to tab 20 of the uh, uh, binder that you have with all of the application materials uh, which contains um, information as to what Spalding and Sly has done by way of multifamily design and construction. When the project is completed, the Myrak family will be purchasing the interest of Spalding and Sly and will have sole ownership of the project and will self-manage it as they have done with their other properties. Also on the team is Paul Boucher. He is the project manager. He is from Jones uh, Long LaSalle. Um, David Gamble of Gamble and Associates is the master planner. And some of you may recognize Mr. Gamble's name because he was on the master plan consulting team for Arlington. The architect is Joel Bargman of BHA Architects. And the landscape architect is Kyle. <coughs> uh, not with us tonight and other team members. And they will be um, on the calls in the subsequent meetings that we have on the particular areas. Uh, is uh, Bowler Engineering. They are the site civil engineers. Edward Marchant of EHM Real Estate Advisors, who's the development consulting, development consultant, and Brian Zamolka of Niche Engineering. Niche Engineering uh, was selected to do the traffic impact study because of the fact that Arlington has used Niche Engineering in a peer review capacity um, and has great respect uh, for their experience and we have provided you with an extensive traffic impact study. The affordable housing lottery agent has yet to be um, determined as of yet. Before I turn it over to Mr. Bargman, I just wanted uh, to review, Mr. Gamble was going to do this, but he is in Brookline at another meeting, just to review a couple of things about this project. When the development team put this project together, they de designed this in accordance with the goals, objectives, and policies of the master plan that was adopted by the Arlington Redevelopment Board in 2015, and the goals and objectives of the Town of Arlington Housing Production Plan and the Open Space and Recreation Plan. And as we go through um, a general overview tonight, that will be those that will be pointed out. This is going to be 130 units with 25% affordable and a range of sized units from studios to three bedrooms for an range of incomes, family sizes, and needs. Uh, this is going to be a redevelopment of an underutilized site and a repurposing of some existing buildings with, uh, as, as suggested by the housing production plan. As a matter of fact, this specific property, 1165 R Mass Ave, was one site identified for redevelopment in that plan. The project offers a wide range of transportation options to prospective residents it has accessible public transportation and bicycle access. And there's a walking trail that is proposed along Millbrook and amenity space to provide a sense of community and neighborhood and a neighborhood experience for those who live there. A, as I said, there's an extensive traffic impact study. The proposed project, the conclusions by niche engineering is that the um, increase in traffic will be negligible. It'll be safe, accessible, adequate, and efficient and there will be a transportation demand management plan, which will maximize alternative modes of transportation. You know, the master plan committee concluded that Mass Ave has the capacity for growth. The town's growth uh, management priorities should include Mass Ave in the Millbrook area. Development along Millbrook has the potential to result in transformative change as our landscape architect will expound upon. The project is attractive to people who work in Cambridge and Boston and, and work bar, as you know, work bar is on the site. So this will give the opportunity for many to live and work on the same site. It is also attractive to seniors because it will give, it, it is local to transportation, shopping, restaurants and the like. 
Uh, the project as proposed will be repurposing certain of the existing buildings with some historical significance. And the brook will be showcased with the removal of encroachments, creation of a walking trail and informational markers. The improvements that are proposed by the development team are in keeping with the goals and objectives of the Millbrook Corridor Study Group. It's going to have connectivity to the bike path and the project will have a number of sustainable construction features. I, I would suggest to you that this is an exciting reuse of this underutilized site and um, I would ask, I turn it over to our architect, Mr. Bargman, to, uh, to provide the plans and go through them. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman Klein. Need to be granted permission to share the screen. Yeah, it should be good to go, Joe. Thank you. So my name is Joel Bargman. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm, I'm going to walk through an overview of the presentation uh, in collaboration with Kyle Zick, who, as Mary mentioned, is the landscape architect for the project. Um, this opening slide sort of says a lot about how we've focused our development. Um, there's historic assets of the buildings that we want to restore and, and add on to. And there's ecological and natural resources that are part of the site, which is the Millbrook Channel that uh, here is running along the Ryder Street extension towards historic mill building. Um, the <clears throat> sites changed over the years and, and that's one of the things that happened to sites. Uh, this picture on the lower left is prior to the Myrak Chevrolet and, and Myrak Hun Hyundai going into the site. Um, the site is actually behind the auto dealership sites and it was a mill site for many years. Um, we're attempting to find out the and develop the core characteristics of what was there as when it was a mill site. Um, and of course, honor the fact that sites change over time and uh, they change according to regulations that communities have brought into uh, effect. So as Mary explained, there's been master planning there have been many discussions about the site and there have been sort of six principles uh, about this particular area in the master planning um, about linkage, live work opportunities, the stewardship of historical resources, natural systems and walkable public realm. And, and the site project that we're going to be showing you tonight really incorporates those six principles. The yellow area on the left is the particular site. There's an extension from Mass Ave that comes uh, in past the Myrak Hyundai dealership um, in between what is called building two and the work bar building, and then building one, which is the larger site at the rear of the property. It extends out Ryder uh, Street extension and out to Ryder Street, uh, which connects to Forest. Um, so that is the extent of the site we'll be discussing and is the ownership of the property. The particular development uh, principles, um, I, I gave you the master planning. We're really focusing tonight on the natural systems, the historic systems, how the property connects to the greater neighborhood and, and the advantage of the greater density. We'll be talking about the Minuteman commuter bike path, which is on the upper portion of the site, that green line on the left. We'll talk about the Millbrook and we'll talk about the third parallel line, the Mass Ave connection and, and how this site, which is now on the, on the right screen here, makes its uh, connection into the greater neighborhood through these three parallel paths. So the way of zooming in a little bit closer to the site, we have uh, 
the work bar site, and I'm just going to take a moment here to try to get a better cursor going. not giving me the annotation opportunities. So I, I'm hoping you can see the cursor. Here you have work bar. Um, here you have building two, and that's the entry to the site. Um, work bar is not part of the development. It's owned by the same, uh, by the Myrick family. But it's, it's not into this development through an organization as a separate property. Um, the, the, Site consists of building two, building one, building four, which is a new building in the back, and the engine room, which is a historic restoration. And here you have the Millbrook coming through the site. That's a little hard to understand. I think um, this diagram here maybe shows it a little bit better. We have the work bar, and then we have a, a linkage of housing that connects the front of the site to a new uh, rear portion of the building. What the slide on the left is showing is the property has a great number of tentacles that connect it to the neighborhood. And one of the major uh, things that we're attempting to do is to tie the Millbrook into the greater neighborhood by really restoring this as a natural ecological habitat and as a pedestrian habitat that connects the neighborhood and connects through our site and has potential future expansion, which we understand as part of the master plan of Arlington is to make a um, stronger connection of the Millbrook. And we're planning to do that not only as a pedestrian, but also as an interpretive and historical um, feature. The site really tries to make a connection up to the bike path. And then to dilute the traffic, uh, we're really having three ways to connect out Ryder Street, out Mass Ave, and then out Quinn Road to Mass Ave so that we can disperse the vehicular activity on the site as well as the pedestrian activity. Here you see on the left the existing condition of one of those roads and then the pro proposed condition, this is the Mass Ave connector, which takes you past the Hyundai dealership work bar, and then building two, which is a new building that replaces an existing wood building that has been damaged by wood boring insects and has ceiling heights that are lower than are allowed by uh, the building code. So that existing building there um, could not be effectively, cost effectively or code effectively renovated. We're proposing to put a new building on the existing footprint. As you get closer to the site, now we're just past the Hyundai dealership and this on the left is the existing work bar building. Here's the new building on the right that sits on the footprint of building two. And then in the back is the historic building number one, which is the mill building. And then you have the new construction, the far distance. Um, what this um, slide is showing is a much wider uh, bridge network. We're going from about 10 foot to 22 feet clear width which now will allow emergency vehicles and two-way traffic in and out of the site. Currently, there's a, a one-way traffic. You can see uh, on the existing, just barely, there, there's a very narrow way into the site that's being cleaned up. The height of that uh, is limited now to 10 feet, four inches, so a fire truck can't go across the bridge today. That, element that crosses over the existing road will be removed. So there will be a full height of um, passageway, unobstructed passage. Drawing on the left is showing the new building, it's the same height as the existing building. So you see that in this perspective, the four story it connects through from the front to the back of the site. 
Now we've gotten across the bridge and are on the main portion of the site. And um, before I hand this over to Kyle, I want to point out that you still have not seen one surface parking uh, space on the site. There are a few drop-off and temp spaces for Uber pickup, uh, USPS, UPS, FedEx delivery. Um, parking for the buildings are underneath the new building, near the first two floors, or underneath first floor of this building. So all the parking on the site is hidden from view. And that accounts somewhat for the heights of the building because in putting the building underground, we're able to increase the impervious surface green space on the site by a quite considerable amount. And um, the trade-off is by putting the, the parking under the building, we get that green space and that um, building sits on top of that parking. It uh, is a good way for me to transition um, from this courtyard where you're coming in from the street into this courtyard. And let me turn it over to Kyle to begin to explain how the courtyard accesses the buildings and creates uh, the beginning of the interpretive site. Kyle? Thanks, Joel. I'm Kyle Zick, a landscape architect with KZLA. So building on what Joel just said, um, you know, it is um, this space with the courtyard is a place where different modes of travel are balanced. It's more of a European space. It's a plaza more than it's a driveway or a parking spot. Um, and we do see that aside when it has those short term parking needs that it is used for special events and that kind of thing. But otherwise, this entry court is a mixture of pavement and landscape and the landscape is drawing inspiration from the mill heritage. You know, it's not meant to be a suburban landscape. It's kind of re-emerging from its industrial past um, with plant species that are appropriate for that. And that the craftsmanship in the site furnishings are all kind of picking up on the millwork and the piano boxes that were manufactured here. So we're using lumber and timber in a way that is inspired by the original use. On the upper left, you uh, upper right, sorry, you have a picture of the existing condition of building one. What um, we are taking off some of the older buildings, and I'm showing you in this photograph. Here's building one on the right of the photograph, and, and we're proposing to remove these little outbuildings that were attached to building one. Um, the back side of that is the picture on the right. So uh, here's building one again. We're removing. It's very difficult to see the cursor tonight, but we're removing this portion, which is this sort of ramshackle set of outbuildings that are really newer construction, not of historic nature, and don't have uh, windows. We are retaining the historic engine building, which is here in the middle of the building of this slide, and some of the smaller garage buildings on the back are coming down. My, my point is that the site is being pruned of its buildings. We're taking off the buildings that are covering Millbrook, and we're taking off the little shed buildings that are attached to the backside of building one. And what that allows us to do is to create um, the stronger interpretive landscape, which let me turn it back over to Kyle to explain in, in one minute. The, Drawing on the left is showing the relationship of the new building to Mass Ave. And I mentioned the building height of the new construction. The building is really 16 feet below the grade of Mass Ave. So that's almost two stories lower than the Mass Ave elevation. So the perception of the building will be lower uh, from the Mass Ave perspective than it is. And um, this is showing that sort of relationship of the building where the portion that steps up is quite far back on the site relative to Millbrook and uh, Mass Ave. No? So the Millbrook corridor is something we really want to celebrate. You know, it's it at its origin was the organizing element for the mill complex. You know, it provided water power. You know, it got replaced by steam power later, but we think this. 
um, should be something that should be a publicly accessible walkway shown in the lower right, a walkway up against the um, conduit wall with a continuous railing and a green buffer separating that from the driveway. And that's quite a bit different than the, the black and white photo on the top where surface parking, the noses of the cars are right up against the Millbrook. There's no greenery, there's no public access. And if you look at that black and white photo even more, and Joel already mentioned this, the connective building that connects building two and one is being removed. So then Millbrook will be open to the sky and it's intuitive that the walkway just continues between those buildings. The driveway here, we show very deliberately to bicyclists because there is a bike room in the a significant bike room in the um, proposed building because we're expecting that people wanna live here because of its proximity to the bikeway. And we're expecting that we're gonna have a lot of traffic for bikes to and from the site. So I just, uh, Mary mentioned this, but this, this is really the, the point of our landscape development is to um, reduce this surface areas that are asphalt and, and green up as much as the site. And I'll show you how we do that more in the further uh, slides. But also the, the whole opportunity is to open the Millbrook to the surrounding the community. This is not a gated community. This is a public access walkway. And the intent is for this walkway to continue between building one, the existing building, and our new building two, walk alongside the historic mill building and bring you into two smaller intimate courtyard spaces. So we've taken you from uh, the access road on Mass Ave to a major drop-off courtyard an urban space, and now we've transitioned between the historic and the new into a very uh, tranquil green space. And Kyle, um, you wanna pick up again? Yep, so the um, thumbnail sketch in the lower left shows where we are. It's a, a lawn space south of the engine room, which is a historic building, which will be an amenity space, a common space for the development. And that is a lawn that is the terminus of that public walkway along the Mill Brook. And it's also a space that will be used by the residents. Um, so it, it's this very flexible space that can be used a lot of different ways and takes advantage of the great solar orientation, you know, it faces south and the connectivity to the brook. On the right hand image here, um, we're showing the existing engine room building, which is the uh, historic building that we are also repurposing for of the residential component that happens to be a new amenity space um, servicing the apartment uh, complex. So the space is really a, a Russian doll of large space with a smaller space in it and then within the smaller space of this side of the uh, development we have yet a third smaller space and uh, the purpose of showing you this is that we have private amenity space um, that is really distinct and separate from the neighborhood so that there will be no impact on the Ryder Street neighborhood. It's clearly on the other side of the site and it's contained uh, within our buildings. Um, Kyle, do you wanna just mention about the landscape treatment and how it varies from the other spaces? Yeah, so each one of the, the open spaces we described have different personalities and different needs. This one is meant to be private. It's like the development living room. It's a place that might have um, dining tables, but also comfortable furnishings, maybe grill station. This is like the equivalent of the indoor common room. It just happens to be outdoors. And the pictures of the building are really showing that we're developing this industrial collage where we have on the left, the existing historic building one, and we have a metal bridge connector to the new construction. So it's very much evocative of the way mill buildings were constructed over time. Um, additive pieces Department. that were connected and each piece has its own distinctive personality. Uh, Mr. Um, Bartman, um, Mr. Chairman, um, just uh, if I could encourage you and Mr. Zick to, um, to wrap up somewhat quickly, I'm gonna lose one of my board members at yeah. nine. And I just want this to is our last slide. Oh, perfect, uh, thank you. 
So the last image here just talks about impervious surfaces existing on the left, proposed on the right. The, um, what um, isn't all that notable on the left and existing are the green spaces. It only makes up about 6% of the entire site. The rest of it is either paved surface parking or building. Uh, surface parking, the pavement makes up almost 68%. On the right is the proposed image. Um, the green space increases from that 6% existing to 22%. And the building coverage increases some to 43. But by doing that, um, we're able to decrease the amount of pavement and surface parking, basically cutting it in half, going from almost 68% to 34%. There's just a, I, I meant to have this earlier and I, I missed it, but here's showing the existing condition. Now we're, I think one of the benefits of the project is providing your emergency access for fire, police, and emergency medical access to the, the site and is, is available today. That bridge will be rebuilt, reconstructed, and um, brought up to new uh, load limit standards. So with that, I'll, I'll stop the share and um, get back over to the chair. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Much appreciated. Um, so at this point, I'd like to open to questions and comments uh, from members of the board. Um, I know Mr. Revelak, I know you have a, a prior commitment at 9 p.m. So I just wanna make sure you had an opportunity to um, have any questions or comments you had addressed. I do not have any questions or comments at this time. Thank you. Right. Are there are members of the boards with questions. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, two questions. One is at an, well, one is actually a very a logistical one. I was wondering if the if applicant has not already done so, if you would be willing to put the slides into the record that you just showed us, it would be much easier for us to go back and look at them if we have a document rather than have to go back to the, uh, um, go back to the uh, uh, recording in order to, uh, in order to experience this, this presentation again. Uh, not that I'm sure that we won't do that from time to time, but it's harder to just look something up that way. We certainly will. We certainly can. Um, one of the things that I thought I remembered from the, and that I was quite pleased with about uh, when you folks made your first um, presentation to the select board um, was a statement of intention to use uh, uh, not to use fossil fuel heating uh, in this building. Uh, as I, I, I understand that for hot water, you pretty much need to do that, at least as things are right now. Um, and I don't see that in your papers now. And I wonder if uh, that has changed. I know the work board is already using geothermal, but that's going to be uh, changed in such a way as to not to integrate it with this project. And I wondered if you could just explain how the uh, the uh, heating and cooling in the building is, is going to take place. Um, I don't know that we've completely decided on the heating and cooling. Um, I didn't get into the sustainable features, um, but we are evaluating fossil fuel free systems versus um, high efficiency natural gas systems. And it's still an evaluation that our energy model will take greater look at in the next phase. Um, it's not entirely clear at this time that the uh, high efficiency gas system is not going to end up being the more efficient system from an energy use perspective. Uh, and um, it does have the advantage of creating domestic hot water as well as domestic uh, hot water for the heating system. So we are looking and evaluating both of those systems um, with the intent of meeting or exceeding the new energy code for Massachusetts that went into effect in, in early November. 
Thank you. And were there further questions? Pat, did you have any further questions? No, I didn't. I'm sorry. I, I thought I had said not. No, okay. Thank you. Questions from the board? Nope. Mr. Time. Chairman, I have a question. Yes, Mr. Mills. Uh, they said they have gone through a review with the fire department, et cetera. Uh, is the fire department happy with the access around all of the buildings? being that they're residential and up to six stories. You know, you might need to get a ladder truck into some relatively inaccessible zones. The, the plans were reviewed with um, the fire chief's designee and um, the building inspector, and I believe the answer is yes. Thank you, that was my question. Yeah. At this time, we don't have official written comments from them, but they are, they are being solicited now, so we should have those shortly. Any further questions, Mr. Mills? Um, yeah, one more question. Uh, the bridges going over uh, Mill Brook, are they going to be designed to, again, support fire apparatus, which can be very heavy? That's correct. That. They are. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Last call for questions from the board. At this time. At this time. Um, so would like to ask if there are, um, if there's town staff who specifically would like to, um, to speak at this point, if you could let me know. Or members of other town boards who are in attendance this evening. Uh, Ms. Chapnick. Um, hi, members of the board and Chairman Klein. I am Susan Chapnick, the uh, Conservation Commission Chair in the town of Arlington. Um, thank you very much for um, this presentation. I, I just wanted to make a few comments um, just for the public's information. Um, the applicant did come before the Conservation Commission for both a working session we gave them some suggestions on improvements of the project in terms of envi protecting environmental resource areas. Um, and as well as coming to the commission for what's called a, um, an RDA. So for a um, determination of applicability of certain standards. And the commission determined that part of the complex is considered a mill, a historic mill complex. And I just wanted to make the public and the board aware that um, just, just for your information, uh, when this comes up to the Conservation Commission under the State Wetlands Protection Act, which we would be um, administering, and you're administering our local bylaw and local regulations, um, then this area that's identified as the historic mill complex which is a subset of the total area, um, is, is, not, is exempt from riverfront standards, which is a big mm -hmm. exemption. Um, that's, that's not an exemption under our local regulations necessarily. We have to look at that. Um, actually, it is an probably an exemption under the local regulations as well, because we reference the, um, the State Wetland Protection Act. So there's a small portion of the site that's proposed to be developed that's actually riverfront area, but a majority of the site is excluded. So I just wanted to make that a statement. The other statement is, and the applicant um, mentioned Ryder Brook. So there's a small brook, it's kind of a tributary um, that goes to Mill Brook. Um, we had a determination um, during our Conservation Commission meetings with the applicant that this brook was not jurisdictional under the Wetlands Protection Act, meaning under the, wet, the State Wetland Protection Act, it's not considered a stream um, for a variety of reasons I won't go into. However, under the local bylaw and our local implementing regulations, 
it's likely that it is jurisdictional. We, we should have those conversations with the ZBA and the Conservation Commission looks forward to assisting the ZBA in these types of issues and resource area protections for this project. So we look forward to doing that. Steve, did you have a question for me? Thank you uh, I much. actually, I actually, it's actually for the applicant. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yep. Thank you for the opportunity <laughs> to speak. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I interrupt the trick valve rally? I'm getting some uh, feedback from some people that are trying to tune into ACMI. They're getting the audio okay. Um, I'm sorry, they're getting video okay, but not audio. Can we ask Mr. Sean Keen to look at that? and see if everything's okay on his end. Again, uh, people trying to tune in and not getting audio. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Is there anyone, any other um, town staff or board members who wish to address this proceeding? You can go ahead and raise your uh, yes, hand. Mr. Um, Mr. Chair. Mr. Revelak. Yes, um, I, I would like to thank Ms. Chapnick for reminding me of my question. I was wondering if there are any concerns about <laughs> uh, existing soil contamination on the site. Not that we're aware of. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Um, Ms. Stamps has been trying for some time to get our attention, and I wonder if we could uh, could turn to her now. Ooh, I was looking for a blue hand. I, um, yeah, I couldn't figure out how to use the raise Ms. hand. Stamps, Thank you. Thank, oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon, for noticing me. Um, <laughs> I was uh, speaking for the tree committee. Um, we never received any information about this project. Um, we did not, the town, the tree warden did not receive a tree plan, um, which anyone, there are no exceptions, um, commercial or private is supposed to, in a, in a, a development situation, is supposed to submit a tree plan to the tree warden um, with all of the um, tree protected trees on the property and protected trees are within the setback. Um, I think it's eight inches um, in diameter. And so the tree warden hasn't seen anything. It looks like there, I saw the request for the waiver tonight. That's why we're on tonight, a waiver from the tree bylaw um, it looks like maybe there are 13 trees they want to bring down. These are big, mature trees. Um, this town really can't afford to lose any more trees. I understand and I'm pleased that the, de the development wants to, developer wants to add a lot of trees, but they're small and it will take them decades and decades and decades um, to get anywhere near the size of the existing trees on the property. Um, but I, I really can't speak to the merit of, you know, removing them or not because we have no information. So I would ask that the, um, the, the um, whoever on the landscape person or whoever it is, su um, submit a tree plan to the tree warden as soon as possible and go over um, the plan with the tree warden um, and get the tree warden's input. And what is, what is um, supposed to be on that tree plan is outlined in Article 16, um, Tree Protection and Preservation Bylaw in the Arlington General Bylaws. We will do that. Thank you. Thank and you, I, I, and I, I, would, I would object to the, the, the board um, taking any sort of a vote on the, the waiver of the tree bylaw until the tree warden um, has had an opportunity to be consulted. Thank you. The, um, 
the consideration of the uh, the waivers uh, will come significantly later in the process. So okay. there's a there's plenty of time for for additional reviews. Thank but you. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Okay. Um, so seeing no other requests from town staff or boards, I will, I'm going to open the meeting to um, the public comment. So just a review uh, briefly. Um, so the chair strongly encourages individual public speakers uh, to be concise in their comments and use their time to provide comment related to the topics discussed this evening. Uh, there will be multiple hearings and different hearings will have different focuses. Um, so there will be plenty of opportunity for public comment. Um, so if you would like to speak, if you could, if you are logged in through Zoom, um, at the bottom of the screen, there is a participants tab. And if you click on that, um, you will see a raise hand button. Um, so you can go ahead and raise your hand. Um, then you'll be called upon by the host um, and you can address the board. If you are joining us by phone, uh, which I believe there, I don't think there's anyone who's actually joined us by phone. But if you were joining us by phone, it's star nine uh, to put you in the queue. Um, so the first hand I see is uh, Mr. Robert Anessi. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Uh, can you hear me? Mr. Klein, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Okay. I can. Yes. Uh, yep. uh, I enjoyed the presentation very much. Uh, the one thing I did not uh, hear any mention of uh, was my building. And my building, of course, is the gray building that was shown out front on Mass Ave to the left of my rock Hyundai. Uh, I, of course, am going to be directly impacted by what is being proposed in terms of the 100, 130 residential units that would be constructed. And I did submit uh, an eight or nine page letter to the uh, board, which uh, I, I saw posted, so I know you got it, uh, which talks about the history of my building. Uh, my building was built in 1845. It's the old swarm house. Uh, and I bought my building in uh, 1988. Uh, when I bought my building, uh, there was a gas station in the Myra Cayonde slot. Uh, and there was no expectation on my, and by the way, work bar did not exist either. There was no expectation on my part that I was going to be faced with 130 units uh, using the right of way. And by the way, we're talking about a right of way. We're not talking about a road. Uh, it's a right of way uh, that basically abuts my property and abuts the Hyundai property. Uh, uh, Yukon Realty Associates purchased the gas station, uh, constructed the, the Hyundai project there uh, and that was done after I purchased my property. Uh, so we've had increased traffic from Myra Cayonde uh, because they have their dealership uh, there now. They come down the right of way. The entrance way to their dealership is only 20 feet away from the entrance way to my parking lot, which is on the other side of the right of way. In addition, as I've indicated, we now have work bar back there. Now we are in some difficult times right now. So work bar is not uh, up to op uh, operational status. We know that, but that's going to get back uh, at some point to where it should be. And we're going to have uh, additional traffic emanating from that site as well. Now Yukon Realty Associates uh, or LLC uh, is another member of the Myrak family. It's not Bob Myrak, it's not Jill Myrak. Uh, I believe it's Eddie Myrak. Uh, Eddie owns the uh, Myrak Hyande uh, dealership. And he also owns, if you come down the right of way and you take a right and you travel to the east uh, and you get beyond building number two, 
That's all Yukon Realty Associates LLC property. Uh, the question for me is, at, at some point, what's going to happen to that Yukon property? Is the Yukon property going to be developed? So if that property winds up being developed, along with the 130 units that, uh, that uh, Bob and Jill are proposing, uh, what's the traffic going to be like on the right of way? Now, again, my property is a right of way and the law relating to rights of way uh, indicate that you cannot unnecessarily burden a right of way. Now, I don't believe that that is a, uh, an affordable housing issue. That would be an issue for a land court judge if it comes to that. And uh, if in fact uh, the right of way is gonna be uh, overburdened, then it probably would be uh, something for a land court judge to consider. Uh, the other issue that I raise, uh, 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 important issue I raise in my letter is uh, the number of parking spots that uh, are being provided for in the building. I believe that uh, 130 are being provided that they need more than that. I believe they might need 161 or so. Uh, the question for me is going to be, what's going to happen with any excess parking? Is the excess parking going to wind up in my parking lot? Am I going to have to play sheriff out there and uh, in fact uh, evict people from my parking lot? Uh, in addition, if uh, folks can't uh, who uh, occupy the building can't find a place to uh, park in the building itself. Uh, are they going to park on the street? We know there's no overnight parking in Arlington. Where are they going to park on the street overnight? So my, I have a problem. Uh, I don't have a problem with the concept, okay? And I don't have a problem with the Myrak family. The Myrak uh, family, particularly Bob, who I've known very well and his dad before him have been very, very good to this town. There's no question about that. But I'm a small property owner. I purchased my property uh, in 1988. I spent a lot of money in, the in 1992, a quarter of a million dollars, which to me at that point in time was not chump change to totally rehab the property. Quite frankly, it was a dump. When I, when I did that, okay? I did that and like a week or two later, I wound up on the list in Arlington, the significant list, okay? Why? Because they thought, the town folks thought I did a very good job uh, rehabbing my building. I do not wanna have that taken away at this point. Uh, I don't wanna see traffic coming down that right of way or going out that right of way. I think that right of way is already overburdened and I just don't want to see additional traffic on that right of way at this point. That's my position. Again, I'm not uh, opposed to what the Myrax are trying to do, but maybe there's another way of doing it in terms of not using and not overburdening that right of way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Inezzi. Um The next hand I see on my list, um, and I apologize, I don't know if they are coming up in order or if they are being re uh, reordered um, as they pop up on the list. But the next name I see is Alex T. Yes, good evening. Can you hear me okay? <clears throat> we can, yes, thank you. If you could uh, name an address for the record. Sure. Uh, my name is Alex T. I live at 2 Ryder Street. Uh, and, I, and I actually had my, you know, I have a, a, certainly a list of, uh, you know, uh, intriguing questions to, to list, but we'll keep it brief here. The, I think the most important one uh, from my standpoint uh, is, is very similar to Robert's and it's about the, uh, the right of way access. I guess I'd like to highlight two points about it as the, the traffic study was a big portion uh, of, of, of the uh, feedback for today's meeting. Um, and, and first of all, I guess the, the, the way the right of way in the land ownership has been described in the architectural drawings, at least, uh, I believe is incorrect. Uh, I don't, I do not believe that uh, the, the 
land is owned on Ryder Street. It's a right of way. Uh, so I would like to see that corrected for, for future records if that's possible. Um, and the secondly uh, is, is really okay. about the traffic study itself. Um, and, and just again, the sample size of two days in a February, I, I don't believe is representative of the nature of traffic on Ryder Street. Um, it is really a gateway to the bike path for a large portion of the Arlington community coming down off the hill. And it's also a gateway to the middle school um, where you have uh, a lot of uh, young children uh, kind of walking aimlessly really oftentimes through the middle of the street you know, along front end loaders and, uh, you know, delivery trucks and all sorts of uh, different vehicles. And uh, just the lack of controls in what is essentially a glorified parking lot has led to a lot of uh, near misses and, and some very scary moments for, for me, my family and neighbors. Um, and so before, you know, moving forward and, and kind of increasing the burden uh, on, on Ryder Street, I would like to really make sure that we have a plan in place to kind of uh, control for those factors. Um, even outside of the traffic study, I think it was noted that, uh, again, the, the, the access to Ryder Street would possibly, uh, you know, add traffic to two of the more dangerous intersections in that study, um, you know, both of which had an above average safety uh, ish, uh, incident rating. Um, and, and I'm talking about the, the Forest Street and Ryder Street uh, intersection, as well as the Forest Street Mass Ave intersections. And so I guess maybe the, the appropriate question, at least for this, before we dive more into the traffic study itself, is I would love to understand why do we need necessarily the access to Ryder Street? Um, as, as I believe it was the developers in our June meeting uh, themselves that said, we've often have done developments of this size with one curb cut. Um, and, and I think Legacy Place is, uh, is evidence of that. Um, so again, I would love uh, to kind of just you know, build upon what Robert was just saying is what other creative alternatives are there uh, as opposed to burdening uh, the immediate uh, abutters? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, so the going forward with the with the hearings, we will have a dedicated hearing um, regarding traffic impacts um, and a more thorough review of the traffic impact study. Um, one of the things we'll be doing towards the end of this meeting is the board um, we'll be requesting uh, review funds to hire a peer review consultant to review the, the traffic study that was provided by the applicant. Um, and so some of these questions will um, hopefully be getting better information um, or at least more sort of general information um, to share with the, with the group. Um, um, your specific question, I think at this stage, we'll take it on advisement, but I ask you to please, um, you know, stay involved in what we're doing. And um, uh, we will be posting on our website, um, the schedule of upcoming hearings once we have them established. Um, the next question, next uh, person I see is Nicole uh, Weber or Weaver. Hi, so Hi. I'm at 14 Ryder Street. Um, thank you for having us here with you. Um, I would like to add to Alex's um, response to the rider, the traffic study. I would like to note that this is a landscaping area where a lot of companies come in and with lots of trucks during the spring and the summer. So that also didn't reflect that traffic um going in and out so the timing of that was interesting that it's down it's probably during a time when the least amount of landscaping is happening in the in the area <laughs> so just to note that as an observation that we need to think about um higher traffic times of both school and the companies that exist in this area um another point i wanted to say is that uh zick brings up a lot of points that excite me about bringing down the paved surfaces and increasing the green spaces. But I would ask that the company or the development, um, one of my worries is I'm an environmental biologist. And one of my worries is that the protection by going with uh, the state regulations versus the local regulations, we're losing some of those protections for our natural resources, right? And then, um, by what Kaepernick was saying about the uh, Conservation Commission losing the local protection to the brook. Also stamps you bring in these things about the trees, the, the you know, the um, 
the more mature trees and they're taking carbon out of this out of the atmosphere a lot more efficiently than the young trees will be for a long time and we really need to think about that for climate in this area um i am a single mom i have a kid going to middle school and i worry about her safety on rider street um and i worry about my safety on rider street just walking back and forth to the bike paths I would also like to ask the uh, development team, we met in June again, we made some suggestions. Have you thought about any of those suggestions? Are you going to implement any of them? Because I know you're going around to all these groups asking for letters of support. We would like to support this project too. I think we're excited about it. But um, one of the things that also impacts me directly is the shadow study, right? My house is in direct line of that and I am not gonna see the sun for a while. So think about like, this is the first house I've owned. I'm trying to figure this out and, uh, and uh, hopefully work with you all in uh, developing this further. And I would also like to note just the organization of this meeting doesn't give us a lot of say in what's happening. It's a very hierarchical meeting and it just feels very strange. So that's just a comment as an Arlington resident I'm in a lot of meetings in Zoom and so forth, and I don't feel like this hierarchical power in those. So I will end there. Thank you. The um, just a brief question for you. Um, you had referenced a meeting before. Was that specifically the community meeting, or was that a different meeting? Uh, the developers met with the residents specifically to discuss the project and comments that we had. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. O'Connor, you are in receipt of the, you and your team are in receipt of the, the minutes from that meeting? Oh, I, I don't think there were any minutes from that meeting, but I do recall there was some discussion about a shadow study, and I believe that, Joel, can you address that? I think you did look at that. We have prepared a shadow study, and um, we could present that at a subsequent presentation if you want. Okay, thank you. Um, were there, but the, the discussion that the applicant had with the residents, uh, were there notes taken that were then incorporated into or considered in the, the further development of the project? Well, yes, the shadow study was performed as a direct result of Ms. Weber raising that at the June 24th meeting. So okay. the answer is yes. So there were, there were, there, there are, there's notes in a record, but there's not a specific set of minutes is more what you said. That's correct. People took notes. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank one, you. One of the other things, um, Chairman Klein, was to make available the traffic impact study, which we did right away after that meeting. Okay. Uh, the next um, is Anran Deshpande. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me okay? We can, yes, thank you. Um, if you could just give us your name and address. Uh, I live at 18 Ryder Street, right across uh, La Licada landscaping property. And um, basically, uh, my, my neighbors have already highlighted a lot of my concerns. And sorry if I'm regurg regurgitating here, but um, biggest concern is traffic. And uh, I think it needs to be studied in a little bit more detail in, in terms of the amount of people that are trying to get the bike path from the new new development, um, the traffic overflow, um, you know, as it relates to the amount of parking. Uh, we often see a lot of visitors already visiting the skating rink and parking on Ryder Street already. Um, <clears throat> and uh, sometimes it's, it's, you know, we, we don't have a parking spot left for ourselves. And uh, I, I can easily see traffic overflowing on Ryder Street, uh, especially during the holidays or during you know wintry conditions and whatnot, and uh, you know uh, affecting Ryder Street. So, if possible, um, you know we would prefer that the entrance is directly from Mass Ave, uh, if possible, to limit the uh, traffic. Uh, on Ryder Street, it's an extremely bumpy and um, you know busy road as is, and it's just going to get worse 
if there are there is an entrance uh, for this new development from right from right street um, like like alex said earlier there are uh, students that travel and walk there on a regular basis um, it's a very popular uh, access road for the bike path for a lot of arlington residents so there's all kinds of traffic so um, from from the residents of arlington uh, traveling across this road and it's a uh, it's it's a very diverse mix of uh, you know uh, people uh, accessing this road, and um, you know if if entry is is planned and it's not in it's inevitable. Uh, are there any plans to maintain the road? Uh, you know, improve lighting. Um, you know, uh, so that uh, the road conditions are uh, don't get any worse than what they are right now. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Winnell Evans. Thank you, Winnell Evans, Orchard Place. Um, I really feel for the, the Ryder Street residents, this is a, a big change to your lives. Um, I have several thoughts. One of, one of my thoughts is that the, one of the most underutilized assets that Arlington has is the Battle Road and the great possibilities for tourism that it um, presents to us, particularly if linked with Lexington and Concord. Um, the plans for the, for the new buildings, unfortunately, completely obscure the historic nature of the site. They, they cover up the, what you're calling building one, the Schwamm Mill building, uh, rendering it pretty much invisible from Mass Ave. So I don't see how this enhances the uh, historic nature of the site for passers-by. It, it really turns it into a specific destination. Um, so I'm concerned about that. Um, I am particularly concerned about the loss of the, the very center of one of the largest remaining industrial industrially zoned areas in Arlington. As, as Ms. Stamps pointed out, we can't afford to lose any more trees. We also really cannot afford to lose any more commercial property. Arlington is teetering right now. We're about to fall into the pit of being nothing but a bedroom community. And I, I, I just think it's catastrophic to drive a stake into the heart of, of this area. Um, as Mr. Anisi mentioned, what happens in the future? Uh, the Myrak family owns, uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, a good deal of the abutting and surrounding properties. What are the plans for the development there? How do we protect this industrial zone? Can we? Um, and uh, in my letter to the board, which I see is in the public record, but I want to get it out there in public, Building One right now contains a variety of artists, small craftsmen, a variety of businesses that are about to lose their workspace. And I'd like to see some kind of plans for their relocation. Uh, perhaps the Myrak interests could think about what they're doing to the surrounding areas. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm extremely concerned. I, I, I'm just really concerned about the loss um, of, of this industrial area. And I, I think it's, a, it's something that Arlington is going to regret at leisure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you find, may I make one um, important distinction? The Myrak family, the Bob Myrak family, has nothing to do with the Hyundai, Hyundai and the Unicorn properties. That is a, a set, the separate Myrak family. They do not control um, uh, that site. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Um, next is uh, Mariah Contreras. Hi, sorry, I'm Mariah Contreras. I'm a homeowner at Two Rider Street. We are working on surround sound in this household. <laughs> um, I, I would just like to um, actually, uh, Mr. DuPont's comment about understanding the uh, threshold leading up to Safe Harbor um, made me wonder and draw concern um, about um, the, you know, the gestalt of kind of our neighborhood. Um, this project, this proposed project being just the first 
uh, manifestation of redevelopment um, in our neighborhood, but um, also Arlington had um, Harriman Associates do a site analysis and recommendations uh, in April 2020 about the Arlington Industrial Zoning District. And in that, it indicates that there's significant um, potential change to the Lalicata and the current DPW site, uh, both which abut Ryder Street and take up that whole, um, apart from Nine Rider, that takes up the whole other side of, or the whole um, Myrak side of Ryder Street. And it, it's a little alarming to think about all the change that could come to our tiny street. One, safety, first and foremost, for people, for property, for the environment. Um, but, and, and things like light matter uh, and the uh, April 2020 report suggests that our neighborhood and um, our properties will be impacted um, in terms of what we see from those shadow studies. Um, so I'm curious if the zoning board is taking into consideration uh, really just um, in support of what other people have said, mm -hmm. not just the Myrak side, but actually the Ryder Street side. What is the near term future? What does that look like? And what does, um, how does the current proposed development play into that? Thank you. Um, so the, the Harriman report, um, so I'm, I also, by being on the Zoning Board of Appeals, I sit on the um, the Zoning Bylaw Review Committee, who's looking at the Harriman study. Um, so the the looking at the Lalakata site, um, that was just an example, a sample site to show sort of what what different conditions, um, what different changes to the industrial zoning bylaw would could allow to be constructed. It has no bearing on. As best as I know, they have no intentions of doing anything different with their property. It's their private property. Um, there is no redevelopment currently scheduled for that. Um, the the four sites that are shown in that are just sort of indicative of different different areas along the industrial uh, corridor that sort of runs through the center of town and sort of what they might be. So there is no imminent project going on at La Licata. Um, and the for the purposes of the, the 40B application here, the comprehensive permit application, um, we, are, we are limited to looking at um, at the site and the sort of the surroundings, but we, you know, what occurs in the future is not something that we can control, um, except if the, if by, you know, if within the next couple of years, the town, the projects that are proposed, that there's enough affordable housing that we, can you know, that we have safe harbor, um, then that gives us some leverage back against, um, you know, the the 40B residential projects. But any project that would be developed by right under Arlington zoning um, is not something that we would uh, be able to to control. Um, so that sort of where that where that sort of falls. I don't know if that answers your question particularly, but um, thank you. Uh, did you have a further question on that? No. Um, I do not, but I would like to state, like I am extremely concerned about all of the safety um, concerns that have been stated by others. Um, I work and have worked directly on Ryder Street for seven years, look out and I have seen multiple children almost hit by cars. I have seen property damage to multiple residences. And I really hope that we can address these concerns moving forward. So I just want to reiterate, reiterate for what other people have said. Mr. Chairman. Just for clarity, is there a sidewalk on Ryder Street? I don't no, know. no, no, okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Uh, um, I just wanted to, to, to remind everyone of what Mr. Haverty said earlier, that the task before the board as over the next 180 days will be to balance local concerns that need to be supported by the kind of evidence we're hearing tonight um, yep. that against the regional need for affordable housing 
given that state law puts a heavy thumb on the scale in favor of affordable housing. So we certainly are going to be considering all kinds of local concerns, including the local concerns of people on Ryder Street. And the more specific you can be about that uh, in helping to build an evidentiary case, the more, uh, the easier it will be to try to figure out some solutions to, uh, if not solve, at least to alleviate the local, the local concerns. So all of these things are on the agenda um, but there's a heavy burden of proof that the board has in order to be able to sustain a decision. And we need the help that we can get from the people who live in the area and people who have concerns in uh, building enough information that allows us to work with it as we, uh, uh, as we proceed through the process. Thank you, Mr. Hammer. Um, uh, Ms. Weber had a further question or comment. I'm going to let Pete go first because he's waiting to raise his hand. Oh. I beg your pardon. Uh, I don't see him on my. He's not. You're so muted, Pete. Can... You guys hear me now? Ah, I can. There you are. We Sorry, you were on screen too. Please uh, go ahead. Just uh, name and address. Thank you. Uh, yep, Peter Maradiano, 17 Beck Road. Um, I'm on the other side of you guys, but I am in a butter and, uh, you know, I am definitely, I will definitely be directly impacted by this brand new change. Um, I, I noticed though that uh, a part of the study was that Beck Road wasn't really included in the study and um, was kind of concerning to me because, you know, my rec wants to direct all this new traffic coming down Ryder, but What's to say they just want to, you know, take a left on a rider? They may want to go right on, you know, rider and head down Beck Road. And the town just recently reclaimed uh, 33 Rider Street, and we've seen nothing but a major influx of uh, of new vehicles, a lot of uh, heavy equipment, and um, and there really isn't a, per se a, a real established buffer zone in our area because it's a mixed use road. So already as it is fire trucks can barely sneak by, especially down Beck Road, and especially when everyone's parked on the street. And then now if we have a brand new development, 133 units, where are all those guys gonna go in addition? You know, people visiting, you know, deliveries, the whole bit. I mean, I just feel that it's gonna really impact our area 10 times, tenfold. And uh, it's, uh, I think it's a good thing what the Myrex wanna do, um, but just to add to Mr. what Mr. Arnisi said earlier, I agree though that um, it's uh, not something necessarily perfect for that exact location. Location's everything, and I don't feel that it would be uh, conducive to this area. And that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Ms. Stamps? Hi, uh, I'm, I'm speaking as a, an individual now. Um, two, two issues. One was the, in the presentation, which I thought was very good, by the way, they mentioned they were looking at a possible gas uh, heating and cooling system. And I just want to make sure they're aware that town meeting just uh, voted to submit a home rule petition to the legislature to ban um, installation of gas lines in uh, of gas to any in any new uh, construction and large uh, re reconstructions in Arlington uh, similar to what Brookline has already done so that may be going through if it goes through the legislature it may well be going through well before they even start uh, work on the project or certainly construction of the building. So I don't know if they're aware of that, but I would hope they would look into it and not try to get it grandfathered um, in somehow because it's a, the town is, um, it, it, that's a big step towards the town realizing it's net zero um, plan and sustainability for the town. So that's number one. Um, the other, the other, um, thought I had was on the pavement, there seemed to be so much pavement in the pictures of the development. 
And I wonder, does it all need to be impermeable? Can it not be? I thought everybody was doing permeable pa uh, pavement these days as being much better for the environment and for the ecosystem. So I'd, I'd like someone to speak to that if they can. Thank you. Joel, Thank you. can you speak to that? Uh, uh, Mr. Bargman or Mr. Zick? I'll let Kyle for that. Yeah, I can talk to that. I mean, we are looking at different paving materials in uh, pervious and impervious. Um, the civil engineer is also involved in that discussion. I mean, the good thing is that it's an overall reduction of impervious surface. So mm -hmm. that um, that's a net gain or a net benefit. Um, but I think the decision of what all the final paving materials are is still something that we're gonna look at. Um, so uh, I don't think anything's set in stone at this point. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Ms. Stamps, does that address your question? Uh, yes, and I would just, I was also wondering if they are aware of the uh, home rule petition that we had filed and if they were going to be taking that into consideration that there may be a, a ban on gas, new gas pipes uh, sooner rather than later in town. I, I don't know if Mr. Bargman was aware of that. I wasn't aware of it, but oh. I, I better defer to him on that. And he stepped away from his screen for a minute, so. Yeah, that was on the warrant for the fall town meeting. We, we'll consider that. Um, thank you for bringing that to our attention. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Stamps. Um, Ms. Weber, did you have anything further? I know you were yeah, drawing um, my attention. After me, I think Karen wants to speak. I thought they had, had their hand up, but um, I think this development would need a traffic light at Forest and Mass Ave. Um, now that we're talking about this level of traffic, it's already hard to get out on Mass Ave. I'm just saying that that might need to be consideration. Okay. And that is definitely things we will discuss more in depth um, in the future when we have well when we have a full hearing about the, the traffic implications. Um, Any other public comments at this time? Yes. Yes, please, if I could speak. Yes, please. Um, if you just go ahead and identify yourself, please. Sure. My name is Tom Taylor. I'm married to Karen Erickson, whose Zoom we're using, so you're seeing her name. Uh, I live at 23 Forest Street, which is at the corner of Ryder and Forest, and uh, Jason to Alex T uh, and Mariah Contreras. Um, I have several concerns. I just want to repeat um, the safety issues uh, given the, the current configuration um, are serious ones. Uh, yeah. There are parking problems. Um, uh, a number of residents have had to uh, basically ban parking in front of their properties because the construction workers uh, or the DPW workers um, or anyone who's in those buildings park their vehicles on Ryder. So there is, at this point, uh, there are times where we have no place to park on Ryder because the construction and other commercial vehicles that are on the road um, are taking up all the places. Um, additionally, uh, the children, uh, as Mariah mentioned, um, coming from school, Alex mentioned it too, I a number of people, uh, Nicole as well, but that, that is a real issue at this point that those kids are very young. Um, they do not have boundaries. They do not check. Um, Many, I'll just say a number of times, not many, but a number of times, um, commercial vehicles, landscaping vehicles, turn the corner off Mass Ave into Ryder, and they're not going five or 10 miles an hour. They're going 15 and 20 miles an hour. And if they're, um, I've never seen an accident. I hope there never has been one, um, but there have been a number of close calls. So I, I would just bring that to the board's attention uh, I also want to thank uh, the presenters uh, for, the, for 
uh, the PowerPoints and the, the points they made. Um, one of the questions that came up uh, for me is that um, I wonder what the impact of all of this. Um, oh, I'm sorry, we've lost your audio. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Okay, I see head shaking. Um, one of the points that's come up for me is I'm wondering about the impact of this development um, on our property values. And I would ask that uh, the group, uh, the, the zoning board, um, if, if this is standard procedure, I would ask for a, a property value assessment in terms of the impact of the development on the abutting uh, properties on both uh, Beck and Ryder Street. Um, a final uh, note I would uh, make here is that I went through the materials for tonight's meeting that were um, on the, the website for the town and the zoning board. And while Alex T's letter was there, um, Mr. T spent uh, a great amount of time putting together a PowerPoint presentation that addresses uh, the documents that we had to review at the time um, that he had, I should say, because it's supposed to his work. Um, and I would like the board to uh, enter that PowerPoint into the public documents that uh, the decisions will be uh, made from, or at least that that be a, a piece of evidence that's taken into account by the zoning board, because it was, um, it was sent along with the letter, but the PDF does not, uh, you know, does not uh, appear on the on the town's record of correspondence received. Thank you for that, uh, Rick and Vince. If you could take a special note of that, um, if we can get that posted, that'd be great. How are you doing, Chairman? Thank you. Oh, you did. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Okay, so any, anyone else wishes to speak at this time? Two, uh, Mr. Mr. T. Yeah, sorry, just one, one more last question. And again, um, it might be for future discussion, but uh, I'm, I know that we are uh, in a flood zone uh, where we are and the previous owners of my house noted a, uh, a flood of the Myrec property years ago. I'm kind of curious if have, have there been any studies about how this development might impact either positively or negatively uh, the, the kind of current flood situation? Um, Joel, can you answer that or? Is it better? Internet's better for the civil engineer at a subsequent meeting. It's mm -hmm. okay. Not prepared to talk about that. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we will definitely have a, um, you know, there will be a series of, of different meetings about this one. It will be about traffic. We'll certainly have one. Um, about the floodway and about stormwater <laughs> as lightning. We will be sure to cover that topic. Okay, at this point, I don't see any other hands raised or anybody else with public comments. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, close this part of the hearing. I believe Peter had his hand up. Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, can you oh. hear me? Oh, Peter, sorry. No problem. Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, and then one other thing I just wanted to touch on, just you know, just uh, just thinking about it. Ryder Street, as it sits right now, is not wide enough to accept two-way traffic. Two-way two traffic goes up and down it, but it's usually one person waiting at the far end while you know, while giving the courtesy to the other person, you know, coming down. So it's just you know something that the town and you know, the board and the zoning really needs to look at and think about, you know, if you want to use that area, you know, it's just not adequately sized enough to accept two way traffic even flowing. So something for them to consider. Okay. Thank you. Um, I will close the public comment period for this evening. Um, thanks to all of you who have contributed. Um, to this hearing. There are now several business items uh, regarding this project. Um, these 
items relate to the operation of the board and the proposed hearings and as such um, are not open to public comment. Uh, the board will not take up new business nor will the, the introduction of any new information on matters previously brought to the board. Um, so the first um, item um, is the so as with state starts, um, we have 188 to conclude the hearing. Um, from the date of opening. Um, and so today is the date of the opening of the hearing. Today is Tuesday, January 2021. And I believe 180 days from today is uh, actually July 4th. Um, Christian, you're on mute. Christian, you know that you're on mute. I did not know I was on, <laughs> okay. on mute. Thank you very much for that. Um, so Ms. O'Connor, um, do you concur that uh, today's the opening day of the, the hearing on this project? I do. Um, so I, I would move that um, having received the assent of the applicant, the ZBA affirms that the 180 day clock for the purposes of 760 CMR section three shall be deemed to have commenced on January 5th, 2021. Um, now a second from the board. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Let's do a quick call down the roll of the, of the members. Um, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mills? Aye. Brewerk? Aye. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then the second item is um, move that the ZBA receive all documents, correspondence, and comments received as a part of the application on um, Friday, December 11th, 2020, and correspondence um up until this date we have a second on that second uh, mr dupont Hi. mr hanlon hi mr mills hi mr work hi thank you um and additionally i'd like to move that the zba incorporate uh all minutes from meetings of various town boards and commissions conducted with representatives of the applicant between March 26th, 2020 and the time of the application. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. And Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. Perfect, thank you. Um, uh, so the next item uh, is a section, is a request for funds for the, um, for peer review of documents provided by the applicant um, under section 53G, um, which is one of the governing re regulations for um, the comprehensive permit process, the board can request funds from the applicant um, for the to hire a uh, review f um, firms to perform these reviews, and um, we'll be looking for firms who could review the civil engineering and site de design um, aspects of the project, uh, the building design of the project, um, environmental impacts, which would include uh, floodplain and stormwater. 
and uh, specifically the traffic and transportation impacts. Um, are there other aspects that the board would be looking to have reviewed at this time? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I just wanted to stress the at this time part. Uh, there may yep. very well be things later on as the as the as the hearings proceed, uh, and as Mr. Uh, uh, Haverty pointed out, ultimately it's possible that we may need a peer consultant on on financial uh, matters as well. Um, so I, I just want to be clear that the motion that we're doing now is not. Uh, waiving any right to get to increase to, to increase the scope of our request for peer review uh, within the scope that's allowed by the statute. Absolutely. Um, so, Ms. O'Connor, we would be requesting um, an initial sum of uh, ten thousand dollars at this point for the. Uh, for the hiring of the peer review consultants. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. St. Clair, I'll defer to you. I believe that's a non-issue. Yes, we, we, can, uh, okay. we can confirm that. Thank you. Uh, um, So therefore, um, ten thousand dollars appropriate time to retain peer review consultants. And building Mr. Chairman management and traffic transportation. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, at least until just now, you, you were you were going in and out. Uh, oh, and I'm not sure that any that anything you've said up to now, unless it's only me, uh, was not was not clearly audible. Okay, thank you. I will restart the motion. Um, move that the Zoning Board of Appeals requests the applicant transfer an initial amount of $10,000 to the appropriate town account to retain peer review consultants in the areas of civil engineering, site design, building design, environmental impacts, floodplain and stormwater management, and transportation impacts. Further, that Town Council and the Department of Planning and Community Development staff be authorized to retain appropriate peer review consultants for such purposes and communicate needs for additional funds for the retention of such consultants consistent with Chapter 44, Section 53G. The board reserves the right to request additional funds in the future to review these or other possible topics which might require analysis by an outside expert. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. Here for it's aye. Um, and I had spoken uh, pr previously with, um, with Town Council Doug Heim regarding um, a review of the completeness of the application. Um, and we had agreed that um, he would um, review the application and review the, uh, the materials and, and uh, report back to the board um, in 30 days um, in that regards. Uh, Mr. Heim, does that still work for you? Yes, it does. Perfect. Um, so then um, I move that the ZBA requests council to perform a completeness review of the application and provide a report back to the board and applicant within 30 days of this evening's hearing. Second. Um, and second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. And Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. And the chair votes aye. 
Um, so I've got to come back to the next item. Um, so I think it would be helpful if the board could have a, um, a site visit with members of the design team um, to get a better look at the property, a look at the existing buildings, a look at the waterway. Um, I spoke with or uh, exchanged emails with um, Christine Bongiorno, who's the, the director of the Board of Health, um, who felt that it could be done safely if we can maintain uh, proper distances, be properly masked, um, keep it to a small group of people. Um, understanding that you know if there is more than if there are three or more members of the board present it technically is a public meeting and has to be noticed um and so i just we don't have a proposed date or anything at this time but i just wanted to um confirm with you that we could uh try to set something up in the certainly you know, in the next couple of months absolutely Perfect. So I'll, I'll get back to you um, looking for details on that. Okay. Um, so the next, the next item um, is a consideration of whether the board uh, should assert safe harbor protection uh, by ways of having greater than one and a half percent of the available land area dedicated to affordable housing. Um, so this, the, the calculation was run on this um, back in 2016 and the this, the decision, the uh, information provided by the town indicated that um, the t that there was a safe harbor, in that the town had over 1.53, uh, excuse me, 1.5% of land area dedicated to affordable housing. That was appealed by the applicant at Thorndike Place, um, which went back to the state. The state um, did not find that found that we that for whatever reason that the number was different and that the town did not meet the one and a half percent uh the town then had the interlocutor um appeal which came back um in the applicant's favor and found that the town did not sustain the one and a half percent um so the and um in speaking with the um the director of planning and community development, there has been no substantial change in the amount of affordable housing um, in the town of Arlington. There have been some additional affordable units created. There have been some affordable units lost. Um, and so we do not have a current updated number, um, but the question uh, sort of before the board is, do we, does the board feel that the prior number is the correct number and we should be asserting it um, or that the board should not be asserting it because we don't feel we have it or that the board should not should concern should consider applying it or not um, on the other factors um, and so I know Mr. Handlin has some specific opinions on this <laughs> if you wouldn't mind um. Before I do that, I, I when when Mr. Rehaim made his initial statement, he reserved some time to talk about this. And I wonder if before I say what my strong opinions are, I could listen to his his opinions and he could inform us a little more about what the what the status of all of this is. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Heim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, let me just offer something really basic at the outset so that folks who are attending this meeting, members of the public who haven't heard about this before, understand what safe harbor means. Safe harbor does not mean that a project is rejected. Safe harbor does not mean that a project is granted. What it means is that there's not a mechanism for an applicant to appeal to the Housing Appeals Committee because the town has met the statutory mandates for affordable housing. In 2016, the town did an analysis. Based on analysis, it was believed that the town had achieved safe harbor status by essentially dedicating one and a half percent of its total land area um, to affordable housing. 
the way that calculation works is both complicated and counterintuitive in a number of uh, general and specific ways. But uh, the board asserted it, as Mr. Klein noted, the applicants in a different matter appealed it, and the long story short is the town lost, didn't prevail. The town can assert safe harbor status in one uh, 40B application and not assert it in another. Uh, by not asserting it in this case, it's not waiving its rights uh, with respect to litigation of its previous assertion in this other matter, the Thorndike Place matter. Uh, really, uh, my best guess based on recalling the board's previous discussions is that the board really has one of two options. It can uh, assert one and a half percent safe harbor status knowing that it will lose essentially in DHCD. Um, or it can essentially say, we still believe that we have one and a half percent with respect to um, this matter that we're continuing to preserve our rights for, um, and generally speaking. But we're not asserting it in this matter because we don't think it would be a productive uh, use of our time. And I, I want folks to know that I consulted both Ms. Mr. Haverty and with uh, Attorney Witten, who's a special counsel, the other matter, and either one of those outcomes um, preserves the board's position. The only important thing to understand is, is that whether you lose in DHCD or you simply don't assert it, we cannot maintain it unless uh, in this specific matter, in this matter, unless you're willing to uh, go through, uh, you know, a, a very lengthy, uh, interlocutory appeal process. And I don't, I, I know that Mr. Haverty is our specialist here. If he has anything he wants to add on that, um, I'd be, leave that to the chair's discretion. But, but those are essentially the options. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. Uh, Mr. Haverty, do you have some comments on that regard? Uh, no, I think Doug um, sums it up pretty well. Perfect. So Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, so now's when I get to have my, few, my, my opinions, I think. Um, I don't believe that it would be in the interest of the town to actually follow here the procedure that we did in the Thorndike case and actually go through a process of litigating this through the HAC, which we would, prob we would almost certainly lose since they've already taken a position on this very issue. Uh, and leaving then after quite a lot of delay and expense, both for the town and the applicant, uh, leaving ourselves with the process that, we've, that we're doing now in the Thorndike Place case. So the idea of seriously pursuing it in this case in an effort to establish it uh, seems to me to be something that's not in the interest of the town and something that, uh, that we should not uh, be doing. Uh, Given the unlikeliness that our assertion of a safe harbor will be effective, and given the present position of the HAC, um, and given the fact that it's unnecessary to assert our rights here in order to preserve them in other cases, uh, which to me at least was critical. I was much more concerned about preserving our rights in other cases than I was at asserting a, state, a safe harbor here. And given the waste of resources that uh, the state harbor would occasion in this case if we went through what is essentially an empty process in order to preserve rights that we don't need to uh, preserve because we've already preserved them. Um, I think that the board shouldn't be asserting a safe harbor here and should proceed to consider this case uh, in, in the ordinary way. Uh, the consequence of that would be the consequence that attorney Heim uh, mentioned um, and it, it seems to me that, that this is one of those cases where we do not have the very sharp clash uh, that we do in the Thorndike case. It's one where a lot of people have said reasonable things. There are problems that need to get resolved and, and discussions that need to have to be had, but this is not uh, a, uh, high, it's not as conflictual, at least at this point, uh, as it could be. And I think that it would just facilitate our moving forward uh, on a basis of, of reasonable discussion of the issues. 
uh, if we do not complicate our lives uh, by uh, seeking to assert safe harbor and then go through the delay and the cost uh, that that would uh, that would engender. Thank you. Um, there are other members of the board. Can you Mr. Revelak. I am inclined to agree with Mr. Hanlon. Other, looking around to the faces of other members of the board, if there are other, Mr. O'Rourke? I agree with Mr. Hanlon as well. Yeah, I must say my, my initial inclination was that we that we ought to assert it um, because uh, we have, a, in the, the time that I've served on the board, we have always asserted it. Um, and it just sort of, it, it seemed like to preserve the town's rights, it was something we ought to do. Um, but in, you know, over the past week, speaking with, um, with various people in the town, speaking with Mr. Hanlon, with, uh, especially with, um, with Doug Heim, um, I, I certainly see that, you know, it would, if we were to assert it, it's a long way to get to the same exact place we would be if we didn't assert it. Um, and there, there is no upside to doing so at this time. Um, and so I, I would agree with Mr. Hanlon as well that our, our better option um, at this time is to not, to not make that declaration um, and to let the process proceed. Mr. DuPont, Mr. Mills, do either of you have any questions or comments? No. no. I, I would just say I agree and I'd like to underscore what Mr. Hanlon said, which is I think that it would divert us if we were to assert that particular um, claim. And at the same time, I just hope that the applicants understand that we're we're doing so should we choose not to in the hopes that this can be a much more cooperative approach and solve many of the problems that have been alluded to by the uh, people especially the abutters uh, who have expressed their concerns thank you Understood, yeah. mr chairman may um, i just interject one thing Yes, Mr. Hahn. I just want you to know that you don't have to take a vote um, because you're not ultimately asserting it. You've got a statement on the record. Okay. Thank you. And and Mr. Hahn, just to confirm as well, if we're not asserting there, we don't. We essentially just do nothing. That's right. I mean, I think it was important for the board to uh, set forth its rationale for the reasons that all of you uh, have sort of set forth, but yes, that's right. Okay. But we do not need to issue a, a specific letter stating that we are not asserting. That's right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you. Okay. So that was the last piece of business in this regard. Um, So obviously the so the next steps for the board um, so we need to get a, the peer review engineers uh, and consultants on board um, and to have them do some reviews um, we will need to excuse me to review um, some of the documentation from the applicants' prior meetings with other boards in town and to determine whether we need to have um, additional discussions with those with those boards in regards to um, uh, their decisions and their concerns um, in this matter. And obviously we are in the midst of um, another comprehensive permit application, uh, which is before us at the same time as well, as well as the other general day-to-day -day business of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, so I would like to recommend that um, we continue this hearing 
until Tuesday, February 23rd, um, which I understand is a fair bit of time, but it will give us time to get hopefully get some positive, get some good information back from our consultants, um, get that in the hands of the applicants. The applicant has time to review it um, before we meet again. And um, in the meantime, uh, we can, um, I can have a discussion with um, with council, with the planning department, and with the with the applicant uh, to set up a, a review schedule that makes sense for the uh, for the availability of the uh, the various consultants um, who are involved in this project. Um, so, with that all in mind, um, I would like to move to continue uh, tonight's hearing. Of 1165 R Massachusetts Avenue, uh, continue until Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021, at 7:30 p.m. Uh, can second. I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, Mr. Dupont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. Mr. Revelak. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. And the chair votes aye as well. Okay. So thank you all for uh, participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. Especially wish to thank uh, Rick Valorelli and Vincent Lee for all their assistance in preparing and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's reporting is to ensure the creation of accurate reporting of the proceedings. It is our understanding the recordings made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the upcoming days. Um, anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. Um, and to conclude tonight's meeting, um, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hannah, and a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. All those board members in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 All opposed? We stand adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night, all. Good night, all. Thank you very Good much. Thank you.